estamos en la segunda mesa. Estamos en la segunda. Buenos días. Good morning. We are in the second round table of the seminar, Decolonizing Urban Territories. The name of this research group from the Faculty of Architecture, Urbanism, and Geography. We welcome you to this first international seminar called Decolonizing Urban Territories, Processes of State Colonization and Indigenous Resistance. This is happening today, 22, tomorrow, 23, and also the 24th of November. This is happening thanks to the support of CONIT, the project on the call for it was a best call researcher, researchers, speakers of different languages, English and Spanish, to talk about different processes of how indigenous peoples in the world how they respond to colonization of territories in nation state. For that reason, we share different questions to start this conversation, considering the current challenges of these tensions, questions such as how the urban expansions affects territories, how do these processes where indigenous people live are affected, or how these planning elements affect indigenous peoples? All of these questions and others will be resolved through the presentations that we are seeing these days. We are receiving different presentations from different parts of the world that consider unique situations through different disciplines. So with different voices, we can see this vast umbrella of considerations that are both urban, urban and daily, as well as expression of this urban colonization. We also have a big, a, a big number of options of resistance where they want to defend their own perspectives as people. Share with us the importance and the need to rethink and allow the space to different ways of dialogues that go further than traditional academic voices. So we can share ideas, reflect effectively and also propose. So that's why you will be hearing during these days activities that look for dialogue and consider the urban planning, considering the indigenous peoples. With this skill and the presentations in the morning, we will also have conversations in the afternoon where people committed with these issues will ask and answer questions in the seminar. We will touch things such as public management, art, culture, and daily life balance. You can also share your questions through social networks so we can get deeper in these different ways of dialogues. So in this second round table today, we have three presentations that well, we really have four presenters. First person is going to be Pablo Fuentes Hernandez. He's going to talk about city and architecture in La Frontera, special theory for a project. Then we're gonna hear from the collective Chiliweke. Uh, we're gonna hear two presenters. 
I'm not going to say the title in Mapuzungun to avoid problems, but in Spanish is mobility, memories, and resistance in Gulumapo, in Spanish and in English, right? Then we're going to hear it is Patia is going to talk about great governance and indigenous local government in a Bedouin town in Israel. We're going to have three moments in this round table. We are first going to hear the presentation. This is going to take about 45 minutes. Each presenter will have 15 minutes to talk about the topic. Then we will have a space for dialogue. Uh, you, the presenters, you can talk with the moderator, and we can also receive questions from the audience, all the people who are watching this through our social media. Finally, I'm going to end with a short synthesis, with a short summary of what was discussed in the round table and then we're going to have a break so to begin we're going to hear pablo fuentes hernandez he's going to give the first presentation pablo please the floor is yours thank you very much dante i first want to thank the organization of the seminar for admitting our presentation second thing is to thank my colleagues for letting me present first. I am without electricity at home. I'm just presenting with the battery. So let's see how long it goes. And I also want to tell you that our presentation is based specifically in architecture. So we talk from space that hasn't been studied in Chile until now. So our view more than decolonizing this process tries to understand the process of colonization and how it opens the, the possibility of decolonization. So our project is part of a fantasy project that is called City and Architecture in La Frontera. And this is a special theory for a project. Our group is made by five researchers, Pablo Fuentes, Gonzalo Cerda, Tirsa Barria, Jaime Flores, and Leonel Perez. Some of them have been in the first part of this seminar as well. We also have other researchers such as Arevalo, Camila Gonzalez. They have been collaborating with us in this project. The first thing I want to tell you is that the study of architecture and modernity here in Chile seems to be a very developed process that most of the texts on this don't talk about La Araucanía nor La Frontera. So it's very curious, a lack of studies in this area. It has led us to a silence, an editorial silence, and we don't know how this urbanization has been made. So it's not very known. So this book is part of it. It's the first book on modern architecture in Chile. And it just shows a couple of buildings in La Araucanía. Then we have this indigenous uprising in Curalava. In 1988, it has resulted in the expulsion of Spanish conquerors in Chile. So this is how the territory among the area and another river was forming what we know today as La Frontera. Mapuche people dominated the area and this created different confrontations between 
is in pass. We have here a drawing made by Bobby, uh, Claudio Gay, sorry. Um, this is something that we want to denounce and we want to investigate the same drawing as he it was used by Pablo Arbena to justify a project. So we see how reality is being altered from people that we don't know which intentions have. This is for legal purposes. So considering the development of the salitre industry, uh, the production means were all accelerated in the country. So this was a topic of interest for politicians back in the time. And some of the resources produced, agricultural resources produced, were exported to other countries, including California and the US. And in this way, they decided to continue with that economic model. We count here with another map. This territory is the one that wasn't touched by Spaniards and where Mapuche people lived. The first Congress of the nation mentioned three provinces in Chile, Coquimbo, Santiago, and Concepcion, saying that Further than Bio Bio, there weren't anything. And then we had new administrative borders in 1850s. Some research studies have shown this process. As you can see here, some of them are Gonzalez and Bermel. In the second half of the the need from the central government brought pressure to this indigenous land. In fact, more than 200 years passed until the state, the Chilean state, went through the occupation of this land, which was called the pacification of La Araucanía. This region implied forts that created cities and towns such as Cañete, Angol, Purén, Cuyicuye, Lumaco, Los Sauces, again, among others. Here we can see Acueducto de Toluco. This was key in that change of situation in La Frontera. This taken from the internet, we can see here the size of this building and the changes it brought. This allowed the train to be part of these territories until Puerto Montt, it arrived there in 1914. So this allowed the expansion of Chile. At the Pacific War, it allowed to implement territories from other countries, and that developed more the political side and public policies in what was called la cuestión social, the social issue, let's say. Then in the South, we have a different context. Gregorio Urrutia, one. In this campaign, territories were added until Villarrica, places such as Ercilla, Echol, Garbarino, Freire, and the refundation of Villarrica. With this, the resistance to the militants from the Mapuche people was considered ended. And La Frontera was occupied with new settlements in order to stop all of this. And it considered different aspects such as the train, the telegraph, that allowed some kind of connection with the capital. 
and it also allowed the creation of laws, policies. This difference in the borders allowed different mechanisms of exploitation of natural resources as an alternative development. This is a very interesting plan. It shows different cities in La Araucanía, and we can see that from a city to another, there are no more than 30 kilometers of distance. So this was the first idea thought from a military point of view, uh, hoping to walk by foot from one city to the other in no more than six hours or by horse. This is a very interesting topic considering the foundation of the cities and the territory. These researchers use the expression border associated to three aspects the geographical aspect and political aspect. This was part of the confrontation in the conquer, the occupation and colonization in what is called La Raucaní. We also have an urban aspect considering the layouts and the development of the settlements made by the state. This is from half of the 19th century until the start of the 20th century. Then we have the architecture aspect that has different stages from the early 19th, uh, 19th century that implies different characteristics in the urban areas from the 1960s. So if we think of these borders in La Raucanía, we can see that we have cities, border cities, let's say, that are there in the border, that are a key way to exchange. They reset the urban life and also are key to economy and services. In this case, we have the condition of its borders, and on the other hand, we have its force in the economic, political, and social aspects. These made them to be the interest of the national in, of the national developments. So, in this context, we have the urban development. It creates a separation between the society that manifests this. We see this as facts that are consecutive and a dichotomy. In some cases, we can see first that the city is layout, and then we create the buildings, and in others, it happens the other way around. It is a comprised process. It's just century that we're seeing here, and it results in parallels. We can see now the political limitation. In the first half of the 19th century, we had a political figure in a border area. This geographical space had two provinces, Mayeco and Gautín that were subdivided for the, by the administration. Um, we had different laws, different years that changed the conception of the area. We had then three provinces, Concepcion with different municipalities, then Bio Bio with Los Angeles as capital, and Cautín with Temuco as capital, and once again, more municipalities. Then the Corporation of Ferment and Production, Corfo in Spanish, established six macro regions. Uh, we found their cities such as Concepcion, Mayeco, among other. Then Le Plan divided the territory in 12 regions and disarticulated this union, this historic union that these territories had. 
then in 1974, the military, uh, the military junta changed this once again. It was reorganized different areas, different regions. Nordic goals nor the requirements to be a region considered that La Frontera had unity, no physical, nor cultural. So in 1978, we consider this area as this, the region of La Araucanía. We have military occupations that started in 1960s and allow the military service to enter to the Mapuche territory. They built forts, they traced cities and towns, and they created schools in different lots. The new cities were built as a new entity to manage different aspects, such as the commercial, the social. We had new programs, cemeteries, hospitals, and allowed us to guarantee the access to water, soil, economy. There was a Romero plan with different experts, considering the form of the city and the location of the train. We have also the architecture as a vehicle of consolidation of the cities for the physical continuation of the territory. We have a common history that's been studied for perspective, different areas of studies, but not from a um, holistic view. We are understanding this as a uh, this modern architecture is far from the academic view and the Chilean history has been fruitful seeing this. Nanokok established a term to this and that is adapted, proper and pertinent. Enrique Braune stated something different from the criticism. Edia Moreno had a different view from the 20th century, saying that this process was a parallel architecture's process. This has a general view, but in La Frontera, this process is parallel, it's urgent, and it's for it doesn't have background before, so it's excluded in the ethnic perspective. From 97, this forced the presence of the state and, their int and its institutions. Until the 20th century, these processes, the forced processes, were a cause to civilize, let's say, through public activities, considering territory and urbanism and different internal variables. As this, the urban area had an impact in the territory from the state through military strategies, the change in the land, in the connection, the productive systems, etc. In this way, the work is where the city is installed at at urban level, and it implies different things in the urban planning. Regarding the institutionalization of these aspects in the public aspect, a number of buildings started being used for the government activities. 
some municipalities, schools, hospitals, markets started being built in these cities. In this aspect, the policies of housing and the public system started creating new critics and founding for these kind of aspects. This process was led to the 20th century and this incorporated social clubs, cinemas. In Araucanía, the architecture had a not even development. So this architectonic aspect started being developed in different ways and had colonizer models based in the European influences. Moving forward, the growth of the elite in Chile started being reflected in the architectonic model. So now we started having changes in the landscapes and the architecture. They promoted an evolution of the architecture since they started developing a hybrid architecture. So now we had a new architectonic expression. Moving forward to the modernity of that time frame. So we had these colonizer influences in the architecture represented in the roof and the way we, they did the entries and where they placed these new buildings. So they show us the identity of these projects and what was happening during this time. So this territory regarding its territorial aspect is framed between 1887 and 1974. In 1883, when the refoundation of Villarrica concluded the occupation of Araucanía and when they annexed La Frontera, in 1974, they had new laws, the one of number 573 and 575, where they start dividing the country in the area that is the central area of Santiago, and it divided the country in 12 regions named after Roman numbers. So this changed the way this was laid out and has had made it have a new division. It took away the name of the area and gave it just a number. So we have a reconstitution. Pablo, could you start finishing, please? Yes, okay. I will finish trying to say that our objective is to analyze this architectonic design of this area of La Frontera. We have diverse specified objectives. And our main idea is that we are trying to understand this development. We just 
wanted to show some urban examples of how this territory was divided in a space in some kind of like um, geometric way and how this was affected in different aspects and from the architecture aspect, trying to understand the different type of buildings that were developed during these years. So in terms of identity and language, we just wanted to have a look at how these aspects reflect all these problems that we have. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Pablo. It was very interesting, your presentation. So now we will go to Colectivo Chiliweke. I will share your presentation. Just give me a minute. Hi, everyone. Before presenting myself, I wanted to present to you our colectivo, our group. This is a, an artistic, cultural group that started in 2018 in Temuco. I'm part of this group, along with Liliana, Rodrigo, Caterina, and Viviana, and many others. In this image that we are looking at, we can see some artistic intervention that we did with our colectivo in Temuco City. This is an artistic intervention that was made in October of 2019. And this is a Um, recent picture where we can see that they didn't do anything to the intervention. We want to understand this through the Mapuche Cosmovision where we are all part of this. I'm Caterina, I'm from Temuco, and I live in Temuco, and my mom is from Quichatura. Next slide, please. She's speaking. Mapusungun. Good morning, everyone, everybody. I'm Viviana. I am from University of Concepcion. And now, I am developing, I'm doing a PhD in United States from where I'm speaking now. And I opened this dialogue where we present not just me, but we as a colectivo. In this presentation, we will, we want to give you a reflection and how we can expand these relationships regarding the Mapuche territoriality. The next slide. The mobility more than a displacement. It gives us a movement in different areas to take advantage of the rich aspects and the relationships between people and spaces through different times. In Chile, this has something that has been 
analyzed by many authors like Alejandra Lasso and many others that look to this kind of relationship. I want to highlight the work of Pavla Giron that is not just a social practice, but it's also a, an important political category that is very useful to analyze this relationship between um, sex and age and identification. We want to question ourselves how we can connect memories, knowledges, and the appropriation of spaces like the urban ones, since mobility is formed by political social movements, we can also use it as an analytic category to see the control systems of the society, including speeches and practices that are used through this movement. Also, mobility regarding oral speeches is always subject to the changes. And it's useful to ask ourselves what happens when indigenous mobility is threatened by colonizers and how this affects the indigenous people regarding the rejection of their land. One example of what I said is the Mapuche mobility to Walmapu territory through routes that are recognized from many years ago. The Mapuche mobility through some paths was important, not only in a pragmatic sense, but also they made a system of connections and meanings that are continuously valid and present in society. Here we had present also the different strategies of occupation of different countries. We also see the control and access to the Cordillera paths, changing the patterns of Mapuche mobility in areas like Argentina and Chile. Next slide, please. During my thesis, my master's thesis, I saw the Mapuche landscape in Curarewe in Araucanía. In this investigation, I could see how mobility prevails many factors that make families and peoples move around. It also allowed to specialize the memories through different paths used to move around through Cordillera and that are now part of the National Reserve in Villarrica. So these mobility aspects have been reshaped due to economical and social pressures. However, these things are still present in the memories of the families and the practices and knowledges in a living process that show resistance actions against extractivism and dispossession in Walmapu. For example, in this image from Parque Nacional Villarrique, National Park of Villarrica, it is known as Mamayuco River, which is very important to understand the spatial context. These are now part of the National Park. However, in this area, beyond being just a route, it was also a resting area 
for the Lomtankura families and for many other indigenous people that used to use these pads and that now are part of national parks and that now they cannot have access to. These territories and landscapes have a special relevant importance from our histories as Mapuche. It's very common the exchange in different areas. Mobility is something common in the Mapuche people. It has always been part of our history. In these displacements and mobilities, we have these kind of like habitat that we have in the Mapuche world. However, what is Warya? Especially being analyzed from Temuco. This colonizer city is laid out in indigenous land. We have had many processes of disposition, trying to make it, it visible this folklore and cultural and indigenous aspects. Our lands in a specific areas of the city, the dichotomies, the development of different aspects are related to our first territories. Next slide, please. When we speak about this mobility, we are talking not only about the displacements that we have gone through and also the disposition. We're also talking about how we are reconfiguring our territories and the way that we live. We can also speak about the different configurations of the Mapuche lives in this city. Like, for example, the Mapuche people that come to the hospital to receive treatment or the settlements where the Mapuche people have brought their traditional aspects. In this resistance of this Mapuche life, we can see how the colonial deaths have been a huge impact in our way of living. We can see the limits and the position and the need to be part of. Here we have a um, camel, sheep, Chilean, and his woman. This is a key animal that was important part of the Mapuche community because they use it as food and as a resource. So it was present in Mapuche history until it was extinct. And it's part of the continuous presence of the Mapuche people that is subject to these social pressures and capitalist pressures. Next slide, please. From this, we, we can see how it is represented this important old animal in our history and how it represents us as indigenous people. We can see these different interpretations of our presence in the city and our resistance. Since we have had to adapt to these kind of pressures. 
Next slide, please. To go to the conclusions, we wanted to highlight how for us as Chiliweques, mobility has allowed us to rethink our own identities, identities through the Mapuche logic. It also allow us to think about our memories, bodies, and mobilizations, letting us claim back our traditions. So it is valid to question these aspects that limitate us regarding our land demands that establish these static imaginaries about what it is to be Mapuche in this modern world. We are also excluded from those urban spaces that are shaped by the extractivism. That's what we wanted to share. We wanted to thank for your attention and we are open to keep the dialogue. Right on time. Now we will continue with the presentation of Eres. He's going to talk about his presentation now. Eres, you can begin. Thank you so much. Let me just uh, share my uh, presentation with you. This is it. Yes. Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to take part in this very, very important, not, not only academically, but also politically and socially important uh, discussion. Uh, I would like to take you uh, several thousand kilometers to the, where it is, to the east, I think, uh, to the Middle East, to Israel, Palestine, and in fact, to the Israeli Negev, Nakeb. Nakeb it's in Arabic, Negev it's in Hebrew. And I would like to present the concept of gray local governance uh, and, to, and to talk about indigenous local government in a Bedouin town in Israel. So let me say, when I say Bedouin, so it, it's in plural, and it refers to the uh, uh, Palestinian indigenous people of the Nakeb, of the desert, in the southern part of, of, of Israel, Palestine. Uh, and this work, by the way, is a result of, of a a collaboration with two colleagues, three colleagues, sorry, with Avino Meir and Bati Oded. And, uh, it is based on the two publications that we already made uh, recently, uh, and, and you can see them here. So uh, uh, my research actually follow patterns of governance in uh, urban local authorities in Israel's South region in which all the residents are indigenous people. So it's a unique type of urbanism that I will further uh, discuss on, in which all the residents are indigenous people. And it's an urban center, a uh, uh, place. Uh, I would like uh, to suggest in relation to these uh, towns, the concept of gray local governance. And the concept, as uh, you can see, is it going well with the translation from English to Spanish, because the presentation is in, 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 uh, in English. Is, is it okay? Any comments? Just, just you know. Okay, let's guess it is. So, uh, yeah, so, so uh, as you can see uh, in the presentation, uh, gray local governance refers to the style 
of, of governance in which the local authority maneuvers between formally and informally. So the local authority is a formal and legal institution. It rests on traditional uh, resources and it serves not only its residents according to the law, but also uh, the traditional uh, social structure and, geo and geographies. And for that reason, uh, I suggest gray local governance as a politics of refusal to the settler colonial logic and policies of eliminating uh, indigeneity. So to begin with, uh, we should go back to 1948, uh, which is known as the Palestinian Nakba and on the other side, the Israeli independence. And if you look at the Negev in particular, uh, the Nakba mean disaster, catastrophe, uh, of 75,000 Bedouin who lived in the Negev before 1948, only 11,000 remained in the Negev. They were governed by uh, Israeli military regime their traditional land property rights were denied and their villages become what are known as unrecognized. Uh, that's mean unrecognized by uh, state authorities. Uh, by the end of the military regime in 1965, the state of Israel initiated a program to, con uh, co to concentrate actually the Bedouin into planned Bedouin only towns arguing that this is the, the right way or the only way to modernize the traditional communities. So it was a kind of a project that they assimilation through modernization, through urbanization. Uh, seven towns uh, uh, have been planned and built. And today of the uh, 270,000 Bedouins who live in the Negev, Half of them live in these seven towns and half live in what is usually known as the unrecognized or traditional uh, Bedouin villages. Ksefe uh, is a quite representative of the seven Bedouin towns. It, it, it was planned in 1982 within the traditional Bedouin territory and it aimed to serve as a new home for uh, the Bedouin in the area nearby. Some of its residents were forced to move into town and I will show you why. Because a new military airbase, uh, uh, known as Nevatim Airbase, uh, was built. And for that reason, actually many uh, of the Bedouins had to move away from their land and to live and to start to live actually in, 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 in uh, In 1996, uh, it became a, a local authority, but the Ministry of Interior in, of Israel appointed a Jewish, uh, that mean a non-Bedouin, uh, a person which belonged to the dominant uh, a group in Israel, uh, a Jewish mayor. And following petitions uh, to court made by the, the, the local Bedouin, uh, in the year of 2000, uh, uh, there was an election and a Bedouin mayor uh, uh, was elected. Now, the geography of Ksef is, is something which is very, very interesting. And I, I would like to, to show you why. First of all, this is, this is can you see my point? Um, um, uh, my point? Yes, no? Can you yes. Can? Yes, you can see. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, uh, where it is now? So, this, uh, we are located, uh, uh, I'm actually, not, at the moment, I'm here on the Lake of the Galilee. But uh, the, 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 the town of Ksefe is, is in the southern part of Israel. And these are the uh, uh, boundaries, the jurisdiction of, of the town is here. And it contains uh, about 13.7 uh, square kilometer, of which 11.2, sorry for that, of which 11.2 uh, square kilometer are claimed uh, uh, as traditionally owned by uh, uh, 
uh, the Bedouin uh, uh, landlords, and only 2.1 square kilometers, which are marked here in a dark gray, uh, uh, is known as a state uh, 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 land. And by the way, this dark gray areas are the only places which are formally planned as a neighborhood. And in fact, we have here five neighborhoods. This is one, this is two, this is third, fourth, and fifth. Uh, the state of Israel, by the way, denied the claims of the Bedouin who, who claim to be the landlord of, of this uh, light uh, uh, gray uh, territory. And of course, uh, the land which is outside the boundaries of the town of uh, Ksefe. Uh, so all the other localities that you can see, oops, here, here, and all these spots are actually unrecognized informal uh, neighborhoods uh, within the boundaries of, of, of the town uh, itself. And there are many villages like this one, this one, uh, some here and, and, and here and here. This is actually a, a photo, an aerial photo, which we actually managed to, to clean it and to, to, to have it only with the spots on it. Uh, so you can see all of these, they are, these are kind of unrecognized villages around the town of, of Ksefe. So uh, the fragmented geographies that we can see here actually divide uh, the resident into three groups. One oops, here is intra-town uh, uh, formal residents. These are people who live in the dark gray area here, here, and here. And they are divided into three subgroups. One are landlords, Bedouin landlords living on their claimed land, some of them are landlord, but elsewhere, that means that they have been uh, uh, evicted and moved forcibly into town. And some Bedouins who never had land before and they moved to town to, to improve the standard of living. Uh, uh, anyway, by the state of Israel, none of them is landlord. They are leases, and they lease the land, the state, state land. Uh, this is how considered, and some of them are landlords. The second group is uh, intra-town informalities resident. That means people who live in the light uh, uh, gray uh, within the jurisdiction of the town. Uh, consider, according to the customary law, they are uh, uh, landlords, and according to the state, they are trespassers. And the third group, is extra town informalities resident. That means that these are people who live outside the boundaries, outside the jurisdiction of Ksefe. Uh, they are also claimed to be landlord according to the customary law, but according to the state law, they are trespassers. So out of the uh, 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 town, as you can see, uh, uh, there are many uh, people who are actually living outside the formal uh, uh, parts of the town, but they are considered to be residents of Ksefe. This is a, a, an important uh, uh, point that I will make immediately. So my focus in this uh, presentation is on the local authority, the Bedouin local authority. Uh, a man that we spoke to uh, as part of this research uh, who live in the extra uh, town informality present uh, uh, why should we study the local authority as a source of indigenous power and resistance? And please take a look at this uh, uh, quotation. Uh, the local authority. Uh, So the local authority in Bedouin localities replaced the power of traditional establishment. Today, the local authorities are a source of prosperity and prestige. 
The mayor is an alternative to the customer law. Thus, unwelcome mayoral candidate might be, may be rejected. This is how important the local authorities are. This is all we have uh, been left with. And this person, by the way, he is living uh, in the, uh, uh, one of the informalities uh, outside the jurisdiction of, of Ksefer. So my focus is, as I have mentioned before, is, 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 uh, uh, is, is has to do with the concept of gray local governance. And I would like to highlight some uh, a conclusion on a great local governance. First of all, a, a great local governance, according to our research, is an appropriate for, framework for the contradiction between customary law and state law. Uh, what's happened? Uh, its source of legitimacy are, are, are twofold, a state law and customary law. Uh, let me explain to you, for example, the elected mayor, the elected council, sorry, uh, our members uh, and the mayor by themselves uh, should be qualified both by the state law, that means that they can participate within the, uh, in the democratic process of being elected, but they also need to be a uh, part of the hegemony uh, uh, section or the hegemony families within the tribe, the tribe which is actually on the land around Ksefe. So for that reason, uh, all the elected mayors in the years 2000 to 2018 live in intra or extra town informality, that means beyond the jurisdiction of, of, of uh, Ksefe. Now, the Israeli law is very clear about it. it, contains that all mayors must be local. This is the law in all over Israel. Therefore, all the previous mayors were registered as if they were living in Ksefe, but in fact, they live outside Ksefe. Not only living in Ksefe, they, they, they hold a, an address in the formal neighborhoods of Ksefe, but they don't live there. They live outside Ksefe. So two years ago, for the first time, Ksefe uh, elected the mayor, which uh, actually live, uh, lives in the uh, uh, formal section of Ksefe. The third point, its border are flexible, dynamics, and interpretable. These borders are in con a continuous shift between uh, the formal, which means state law, a jurisdiction and the community living space. The, the local authorities, this is very important, the local authorities serve the tribe members within and outside the town. That means people who are living outside the town enjoy schooling, water supply, cleaning services, and more. Actually, uh, the fact that they are unrecognized by the state doesn't mean that they are unrecognized by the local authority. The local authority says, okay, the state doesn't recognize you as, as, as villages, but we are one tribe, so we serve, the, the local authority actually serves uh, the Bedouin around it. Now, the fourth point is that it reflects uh, the great local governance reflects traditional geographies, both by the internal uh, legal organization of space and its functional space. The, the local authorities, for example, prevent, let me take you back to the map, for example, the local authority prevent a development and planning in the light a, a gray area because this land is claimed by the Bedouin uh, landlords. Now, the state of Israel, of course, would like to uh, uh, plan this area and to do something with the land that we consider to be its own. Uh, the local authority may, may have a lot of economic interest in developing this land, but traditionally speaking, and this is very important, traditionally speaking, this land belonged to Bedouin landlord, and for that reason, the local authority prevent any planning in this land in order to prevent the expropriation of the territory of the land from its Bedouin uh, uh, landlord. And this is a very interesting way of dealing with planning and the rule of local authority. Now, the, the, the fifth point 
and this is the last one, is that gray local governance uh, reflects traditional geographies as it is influenced by external and out and, and, ex, and that means people who are living outside the jurisdiction, power and communal politics. Let me tell you, there are many people living outside the, the, the town, but they are registered as if they are resident of the town in order to participate the, the, the local elections. In fact, the people who live outside the town influence who is going to be the mayor. And this is part of the game. And people, you know, who live in Sefi said, this is part of, of the tribe. You know, the local authority is part of the tribe. It has nothing to do with the geography, the formal geography of the state. I think that this is, this will be enough in, uh, to present the great local governance. I really would like to thank you for, for inviting me and to take part in this very important conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Eris. Eh, bueno, ahora partimos con un espacio de discusión. Entre... Now we start with the debate space. I don't know if you have questions. If there are any questions. Does anybody have a question for the speakers? Sorry, I wanted to ask Caterina and Viviana because I was very interested in their presentation. I just wanted to ask if you have detected these layouts, to say so, in this territorial scale, and if these are similar and that can recognize in the urban one. Similar, do you, are you speaking about the ones that are overlaid in the urban laid out? But regarding what? The routes? Or another type? I say in general. I understand that you show a territory that is impacted by other traditions and other practices. I wanted to know if you had similar layouts that are similar to the urban one and if they are recognizable, understanding that the urban layout, either I like it or not, it's a reality in the territory. We the thing that was very evident and clear was how the urban layout started to overlap to the Mapuche territory. We can see how the city started being mapped, like what happens in Temuco and other cities in the south of Chile, which is not something that is not relevant. We debated a lot about how in these ways of identity, we speak about migration to spaces where they start building new places. But in this case, we are in Mapuche territory and somehow what we see is a continuous appropriation of the land. And here we have a need of recovering these territories. That's what we are interested in and what we wanted to highlight and what we wanted to expose when we are working with indigenous territories or in this ways of understanding the, the cities. This is how 
these cities are laid out in indigenous territories. That's what I can answer. I don't know if you, Katerina wanted to add anything. When I presented myself, I didn't say anything, but I am from the health industry. So I'm in a um, public health masters. So when they speak to me about configurations, I speak about how the lives are being configured in the territories and how this, with this movement of the bodies, the territories also move. But what Viviana said is very important because we claim back the territories that are still indigenous territory, even though they are being developed and configured as urban spaces. They're putting layers on tops that are making invisible the presence of indigenous people. So that's a threat to us as indigenous people, individuals. And that is reflected to political uh, decisions or health politics, policies, the project of assimilation is like that that's like the main i don't know if we are answering your questions yes yes i think this is an interesting case so i think there is a dialogue between these two situations or in the historical layers so that was the focus of my question. Thank you very much. Is there any other question? Does anybody has another question? If not, then I will start asking my questions. Okay. I will start with Pablo. Pablo. It is really interesting what you say about your project regarding how this is being developed because for us from the north, this is very unknown. We are very far from your region. And this is very interesting of how things develop in Chile. It got my attention this configuration of cities that were very near each other so you could move from one to another very quickly. So that configuration had any other purpose beyond the military use of this near configuration? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Uh, I am very low, I have very low battery, so I will answer this quickly. I am afraid that uh, how Jaime Flores explained, this is a process. There is not only one reason. There is, this is a process that has different reasons. The capitalism of the 19th century obviously impacted these decisions. But I think this is a military logic in the sense that they establish one point from the other to a 30 kilometer distance. If you do that route, you will see that in car, you it doesn't take you more than half an hour to get from one point to another. And I think this is a very new way of laying out the cities. And I think that is an strategy a strategy that wants to have control over the space and the areas. So I think the origin is military, which is just one more element and ingredient of this capitalism. 
and this accelerates this process of urbanization in the territory. I'm not defending the urbanization process. This is just a mere fact, a territory that is without Western intervention until 1960s was accelerated brutally in no more than 30 years. So it's the expansion of the capitalism and that how is that shaped? That's what I can give you. Thank you, Pablo. Does anybody else have any other question? Any other comments? I just wanted to add to what Pablo said, that the role of tourism in other places started reconfiguring these imaginaries regarding these territories. It made a lot of sense to see that image of Pucón about how with this colonization objective, they use these touristic forms to try to use these spaces and also highlighting other types of imaginaries that had a European influence. I just wanted to say that that was very interesting regarding that image. Oh, Thank you, Viviana. Pablo, I think he has a comment. Hola, yeah. I wanted to say, Hi to all the speakers. It's very interesting, all the presentations. I put my question in the chat. The comment is that with some of your presentation, I remember a key concept that is in the work of Rogelio, that is transitionality that speaks about the experience of multi-territoriality and that expression of mobility. Maybe that would be very interesting to work on. And my specific question for Viviane and Caterina regarding, besides the mobility practices, if they know other experiences of conflict in borders, in other national areas that were carried out by the Mapuche people. Do you know any other conflicts regarding that? Thank you. It's a pleasure to see you. Regarding your questions, actually, now there are a lot of conflicts regarding national parks. There are different pull-offs in the areas in the south that are being claimed so they can recover these areas in the parks. They are also claiming the use of other areas of indigenous peoples. So this has led to other type of meetings that involves another perspective of seeing Wolumapo, thinking about the relationships that are carried out in Wolumapo. And as Mapuche people, we have been built by these relationships that have existed with Argentina. That's what I can comment regarding the conflicts that are now, especially with 
with this problem that goes around the existence of sites in areas that are where originally from the indigenous people and now are part of national parks and are being taken away from them. We also have conflicts regarding tourism because it has been an invasive element. And we can see the way this has been, been built, trying to keep developing these imaginaries without considering the communities. So I think it's really interesting because it also implies that we have to think about how as indigenous people, we have a political position, not only folkloric position. That's what I can answer. The, uh, from my experience, I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. Greetings to you, Viviana. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Viviana. We have a question in the chat for Edis. I will read it in English. Please. How do you see the similarities or difference between the Chilean case exposed today and your experience in Palestine, Israel? Or maybe a simple question, uh, what caught your eyes about the presentation as a foreigner? Eres? Yes, thank you. Uh, this is a good question because we, we all the time try you know, to build uh, uh, models and theories which are universally uh, good for every place. And, and, and I'm not sure about that. Uh, I think that the, the case of Israel, Palestine is, is a bit different because, you know, first of all, uh, Israel occupied a, a part of the Palestinian territories. Uh, this is well known. And the case that I presented, so it, it, it is within the borders of Israel, official Israel, recognized Israel. Uh, still, there are Palestinians who live in this uh, uh, region, and they are composed perhaps 40% uh, of the population in the area. And even today, this territory in the Negev, because 40% of the, the people living there are Bedouin, is still a target for what we call a Judaization uh, policy. Nobody called it this way, of course, because you know it's considered an undemocratic uh, way to, to say uh, uh, development. So the, the, the facade of development actually refers to bring more Jews uh, to this area to build more uh, uh, localities for, for, for the Jews and, and to minimize uh, uh, the space and the geography of, of, of the local uh, Bedouin. However, uh, we face a lot of human rights activities and, and resistance and you know, things are, are trying to change, uh, are starting to change because more and more unrecognized villages are now recognized. And it's everybody uh, in the, within the, the establishment, the, the institution, the authorities says that it, it cannot continue this way. Something uh, needs to be done. But uh, so, so there is a kind of, you know, because of the complex, complexity of the politics, I'm not sure that the uh, uh, comparison between Israel and Chile is something that we should uh, uh, take uh, uh, for granted. However, there are some ideas uh, and uh, discussions on resistance and, and, and politics that may serve both sides. Uh, this is what uh, I guess uh, can be a, a good uh, question. However, we should pay attention to the uh, local conditions, local politics. These are very important uh, issues that we uh, should bring in our minds when we start to, to compare between uh, uh, cases. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Um, yes, I have a question for 
Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question about the colonialism in Palestinian. Um, uh, and if you can see some similarities between Palestine case and indigenous struggles in South America, for example, and the form how settler colonialism is reproducing this or, or, or modeling these um, I, uh, gray areas in, in, the, in both cases. I don't know if you so, <laughs> my question. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh... It, it's a good question. No, no, I understand it. Uh, I'm, I'm again, you know, the concept of settler colonialism become very famous and uh, very popular, and uh, it's a good concept. I mean, it's a good frame. Let's say it this way. Uh, you know, there are arguments between uh, researchers about what is the exact meaning of settler colonialism, and I said it doesn't matter. Uh, we need to take it, we understand what we, what is, uh, has to do with politics of settler colonialism. Uh, so the details uh, can be relevant to one place and not to other. Now Israel Palestine, of course, become a symbol of contemporary settler colonialism and for good reason. Uh, I do not deny, by the way, I, I by myself, I belong to the, uh, 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 Jewish population in Israel, so I'm part of the hegemony, uh, so-called, uh, so it, sh it should be clear that I'm not a Palestinian by myself. Uh, so whatever I said, it's come from a viewpoint of researcher. So from my point of view, colonialism as a frame is a good uh, area uh, to start to discuss uh, issues with decolonization, uh, territory, uh, law and planning. And, but we should not try to have arguments if what are the correct uh, uh, components of, of settler colonialism, as usually we can find in, for example, in uh, uh, settler colonialism, settler colonial studies, for example, the very famous journal that I know that some of you already published uh, uh, some articles there. Um, but still, Israel is a good example for settler colonialism because it's taking, taking place today and now. And it's a, a very vivid, unfortunately, very vivid uh, uh, settler colonialism. And there might be some uh, 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 good uh, understanding of the meanings for other places, but we should be very careful about it. And so this is what I think that we should be very careful with, with the attempt to talk uh, other settler colonialism according to Israel's settler colonialism. In one of our papers, Jaime Jacobi is going to present his uh, paper, film tomorrow actually on Gaza. Uh, we name uh, the contemporary settler colonialism in Israel as a neo-settler colonialism. That means that we try to combine neoliberalism, capitalism with settler colonialism, and we try to figure out uh, uh, the, uh, how both of them work together. And, and, and in fact, there is a kind of uh, symbiotic relations uh, between the two. And within this frame, I think that uh, gray local governance is something that we should focus on because gray local governance refers to uh, 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 local authorities of indigenous people. That means how do they manage, maneuver, not only uh, in front of settler colonialism, but also in front of capitalism and neoliberalism? How do they preserve uh, 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 the context of traditional uh, 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 landlordship uh, in front of uh, 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 land values and development and this kind of thing, which has to do with so-called the capital, the capital or the neoliberal uh, uh, logic. Uh, and, and I think that gray local governance is not only maneuvering between two sets of law or, or sets of geographies, 
It's also as to, to maneuver between sets of settler colonialism and neoliberalism at once. And, and for that reason, I think that uh, we also can uh, think about the uh, neo-settler colonialism as something that might be a good frame uh, uh, to other uh, uh, places uh, where settler colonialism took or take place today. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other question or intervention? Okay. Pablo Mancilla. I'm paying attention to what you are talking about. And regarding the last questions, regarding the comparison in what happens in Latin America and Palestina, there is some work that has been done that is the reflection of the Aquile Mendes, doctor who is a philosopher, post-colonial philosopher that works the concept of necropolitics to work with these countries that have intercolonialism, which is the case of Latin America or in Palestine. This concept can be applied that questions the concept of power and necropolitics speaks about this power that is that has in these territories. Aquile member Mendres works really well with this notion of the geographic dimension, how these places are built with these imaginaries and how the borders are built to identify these areas. And he also quotes the your work, I guess, because when I was hearing you, I remember that you were quoted regarding these processes. So maybe that's a way we could approach this and see how we can compare these situations in different parts of the world. The necropolitic can be a key for that. Thank you, Pablo. I'm not familiar with, uh, with this writing. Is it possible for you, please, Pablo, to, to, to write the name of the, the researcher, of the scholar, because I'm not familiar. I know that there are many comparisons between Israel and South Africa, apartheid South, South Africa, of course. Uh, but once again, I mean, I think that the uh, uh, local conditions uh, 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 should be uh, taken into consideration and we should be very careful and when we try to implement a, a model or theory, which is a, a universally uh, applied, I'm not sure about it. I mean, I'm trying to avoid this uh, positivist way of thinking, uh, even in terms of uh, uh, settler colonialism. I mean, uh, it doesn't ju uh, justify what is going on in, in terms of politics, uh, real politics, yes, you know, the discussion on politics, but real politics, it doesn't, uh, 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 justify what is going on in Palestine, Israel. I mean, uh, the comparison can be very good and can uh, help us understand the process that we are facing now and uh, the moral uh, uh, issues related to it. And these are real, very heavy uh, uh, moral issues, uh, as we probably know. Uh, but again, I, 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 I'm just clicking now the 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 links that say you you sent to me thank you and i will read about it i'm not familiar with that thank you i also wanted to add 
a comment regarding what Pablo says, thinking also about the work the it is about how many times when we speak about indigenous people or communities, there is also some reduction regarding about how they are understanding the Mapuche organizations because we have to remember that in Chile's case, the state, the government has institutionalized some organizations and, and started trying to understand these indigenous peoples from other way, but these weren't like all the same. regarding the traditional Mapuche organizations that are many times in conflict or have to try to coexist with these government organizations that sometimes are useful, but not all the time. So this can be taken to other type of, other type of organizations. And this is a reflect not only about the diversity of the Mapuche people, but also put the complex situation about what we speak about when we refer to Mapuche communities. So that gives a little bit of answer to this logic in the territory. And I agree with Eres that we have to pay more attention to those local logics that come from other histories or stories or other realities that were built with from traditional organizations. And this stories that are very present in the families. Regarding this all regarding to what we mean by indigenous communities in Chile, Chile's context. Thank you, Viviana. I share also that issue. When we start looking, there is our, an articulation regarding the government's side trying to have these borders, limited spaces, they start making these classifications. And this is part of the history. And uh, about the human side and the architectonic side. And this has a great impact in the communities that didn't have these categories that the government imposes. The indigenous communities are intervened by different aspects. Regarding this strategy of survival that the communities or indigenous peoples have applied to survive regarding what they have gone through with the state or without the state or the government. So this is something that allow us to see that regarding urbanism, you have different aspects where they can agree with or they can reject. So these are spaces that the government creates. Some communities take it as an opportunity for their development. And this is a development that is very different from the traditional. And it seems that the government is always taking forward their strategies of, strategies of development. But for the indigenous people, we need indigenous strategies. And this is an invitation for the discussions 
in the afternoon with people that work in public institutions related to planification and housing. And we need to try to look for spaces that make this complexity not that complex, to say so. And to speak about this relationship and this abuse and this colonization concept, sometimes there are part of the indigenous people that are that agree with these government strategies to decide and to move them from their areas and that creates a conflict within the indigenous communities when you have this kind of acceptance by one part of the communities. I want to thank all of you for your participation, especially to Eris that is in another time zone. And I don't know if it's early morning for him or late night, but I think this is a difficult time zone for you. But I thank all of you for your participation. And in the afternoon, we will have a some other discussions and some presentations so we can keep learning and keep developing this conversation. Thank you very much for your contributions. We will see each other in the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Buenas tardes. Mirando la distancia. Gracias, Julián.